Okay, let's get this skill started off right by talking about virtual machines. Now I've mentioned virtual machines in prior skills, and I've also mentioned that virtual machines, or at least the idea behind virtual machines is nothing new. It was used in mainframe computers as early as the 60s and 70s. But recently, virtual machines have really taken off, and it's what has enabled the growth of cloud computing. So let's talk a bit about just what is a virtual machine. So let's take your laptop, a physical laptop. Maybe you have a desktop, whatever you're watching this video on, it is a physical thing. You can pick it up, you can put it in your backpack, you can stub your toe on it during the night if it's a, one of those big desktop units that sits on the floor. But let's say when your laptop goes to sleep, it dreams. It dreams of all these other different machines that it can be. Well, those aren't real machines. Let's just call them virtual machines. Now we have some software that we can load on this physical machine that will allow us to create these virtual machines. And how it does that is it emulates it. It basically imitates a CPU, it imitates RAM, it imitates the USB port that you have your mouse plugged into, for example, and that allows us to run these virtual machines on physical machines. Now, the cool thing about virtual machines is that because they're not physical, we can actually move them to other physical systems pretty easily. Now, these can be in the next room, they can be on the other side of the globe. So that's why virtual machines are so important to cloud computing because the cloud computing vendors can just build the hardware to run the software to support virtual machines, and then we can shuffle our virtual machines around however we want to. Now, how do we do that? Well, there is this concept called an image. That brings us to our first techie term of this skill, an image. It's just a bit-for-bit -bit copy of a disk. Now, that disk can be used to boot up a computer or boot up a virtual machine into an operating system, or it can be just some data that we have on this disk. But that image allows us to quickly copy that virtual machine, it allows us to hand that image to some other physical computer, and we can run that virtual machine on that other physical computer. You can give an image to your buddy, and then they can run that exact identical virtual machine on their system if they happen to have that same software that runs virtual machines. But this concept of an image is really, really important for virtual machines, and we'll see that later. But first, we're gonna talk about probably the most prolific AWS service, that being Elastic Cloud Compute, or we just abbreviate it and say EC2. Now, EC2 is the service that AWS has created to do nothing but run virtual machines, and it does that very, very well. Now, typically when you set up a virtual machine, you have to specify how much RAM and how much CPU and that sort of thing you're gonna allocate to that virtual machine. Well, AWS has over 700 different variations of VM types that we can use. So regardless of what your workload is, you're probably gonna find a VM type that has what you need in the way of memory, CPU, storage, maybe graphical processing unit power. There's just a variety of different attributes that these different variations of VMs have. And they range anywhere from very generic and general purpose all the way to very hyper-optimized for specific use cases. And we even have an option if we look at all these virtual machine types and say, nah, I still want a physical machine. We can even provision a physical machine. In other words, we can call up AWS or not call them up, go out to the AWS console. We can provision or select a physical system. And that physical system is going to be in some server rack in an AWS data center and it's gonna be all ours to do whatever we want to do with it. Now, when we're talking about different VM types, we really need to spend a little bit of time on the naming. So this is the name of one such VM type, one of those 700 different types, and let's deconstruct what, 
we're seeing here. So first, this M, to me, I immediately recognize that because I know the instance type naming structure, and M means general purpose. I know it's not very intuitive in this case, but just bear with me here. The, the first letter generally represents what sort of specialization this instance type has. And we'll see some examples of some other letters that will lead off these instance types. But in this case, M represents general purpose. Now we have the seven here. Now that seven represents the seventh generation of this particular instance types. Occasionally, AWS will come out with a new generation of instances that typically have more memory, better performance, maybe they cost less. But there will be cases where maybe they have an M5 instance type, an M6, and an M7. Now, if you're just going out there for the first time, you're probably going to choose the latest and greatest version. But there are other customers who have selected these when they were the latest and greatest, and they've just stuck on them over the years, which is perfectly fine. Now, this I here tells me that this is an Intel-based instance type meaning Intel CPU. Now, if it, if it was an A, that would tell me it was an AMD processor. And if it was a G, that tells me that it is a Graviton processor. Now, what is a Graviton processor? Well, AWS has invested in building their own CPUs, their own computer processors. And one of their CPUs they call a Graviton. Now, it is an ARM-based processor. What's that mean? Now these two right here, Intel and AMD, are typically what you would run in most home computers. And they're very popular in data centers as well. They use something called an x86 instruction set. Now a different instruction set is called an ARM instruction set. And as a matter of fact, it's ARM64. And the takeaway here is that this software is not compatible with this software. You have to have special versions of software that is ARM64 compatible such that you can run on a Graviton processor. Now, why in the world would you want to run on a Graviton processor? Well, cost. Because AWS invented this Graviton processor themselves, they're not having to pay royalties or licensing fees or purchases to Intel and AMD for running their processors. So they can offer these Graviton-based instances for a lower cost. Okay, so continuing on, we have this large part here. You'll see different sizes. You'll see nano, micro, small, medium, large, X large, 2X large. And that just represents how much CPU and how much memory that particular instance has been equipped with. So let's look at some other naming here. We have M, that's the general purpose. If something started with a T, that would tell me it is a burstable instance, and we'll talk about what burstable is in a minute. If it starts with a C, it is a compute-optimized instance. That just means it probably has more CPU and less RAM. Now, a memory-optimized instance, the one that starts with R here, is exactly the reverse. It has more RAM and less CPU. We have instance types that start with a G or a P, and those are GPU optimized, and they're usually used for video editing or stuff like that. Now, maybe our application requires a lot of disk I.O., a lot of disk input output, and we might opt for a storage optimized instance type in that particular case. But wait, there's more instance types. We have the Mac instance type, which is a physical machine. It is not a VM. So if we go out there and select a Mac instance type, it's going to be a real Macintosh computer sitting in an AWS data center on some rack somewhere. We have high performance computing instance types. We have X, which is a really large memory footprint. footprint. We're talking about like two terabytes of RAM and you would use these for in-memory databases like SAP HANA. We have a very specialized instance for video transcoding called VT. We have a couple instances that are specialized for machine learning. We have something called a free field programmable gate array, which that instance type will begin with an F. 
Now for the cloud practitioner exam, you certainly don't need to memorize any of these letters and you certainly don't need to memorize any specifications for these different instance types as far as CPUs and RAM. But the takeaway here is just know that we have many, many different options to choose from and it's on us to try to figure out what is the best instance for our needs that will also be most cost effective. So let's look at some other naming here. We have R, again, that tells me that this is a memory optimized instance type. We have the seventh generation, and this is running on an Intel processor. Now we have R7A, this A tells me that it is an AMD processor. Generally speaking, instance types that run AMD processes are slightly less expensive than their Intel counterparts. Then we have R7G. Now this G tells me that it's a Graviton. Why that's important is that if I have software that can only run on the x86 instruction set, in other words, it can only run on Intel or AMD, it will not work on this Graviton system. Now here's another dimension we can look at. We have large, we have x large, and we have 2x large. They go all the way up to 4x, 8x, 12x for some families. This tells me it's a compute optimized. This is the seventh generation of the compute optimized. And we're using a Graviton processor in this instance. Generally speaking, an extra large is going to be two times a large and a two X large is going to be two times an X large. So you could also say that this large right here is going to be four times as large as the dot large. Now, what does this mean? Well, that just means that it has four times as much memory and probably four times as much virtual CPU. Now it varies slightly because some instance types are memory optimized, some are compute optimized. Again, you don't have to worry too much about memorizing all this stuff. I just wanted to explain this naming construct so that when you see it in the wild, then you will kind of understand what it's saying there. So let's look at burstable instances. Now for burstable instances, we have the T2 family. We have a T3, we have a T3A, and a T4G. So again, this is the AMD, this is the Graviton, and these are both Intel processors. Now what is a burstable? Well, let's say here is our load. So we're going around here, and then we have a spike, and then we're low for a bit, and then another spike. So what we might be tempted to do is maybe select an instance that would be capable of that performance, that level of performance, because we have these spikes. And the problem is all this other space in here is just gonna be wasted. And the bigger the instance, the more we pay. So this would be wasted money. So instead, maybe I wanna select a burstable instance that's maybe right here. Now what burstable instances do is it allows us to bank this unused processing power and it's going to allow us to use that in a sort of credit exchange we we earn credits whenever our cpu is below some sort of average threshold and then when it spikes we can apply these credits to that load and so these burstable instances are a pretty popular option if you really don't know how your computing resources are gonna be stressed. So if you hear somebody talk about burstable instances, that's the concept behind the burstable instances. Think about us as just being able to save up for those peak spikes and we can use these credits, these CPU credits for those spikes and what that allows us to do is basically have an overall lower cost for our instances because we don't have to use a larger instance just to meet those occasional peak spikes.